It don't matter what I try I just can't win and I don't know why There's a fork in every road I pick the wrong one and then I go American loser, yes I am Disenfranchised from everything well, I fall up and I fall down An American loser the day I was born Hello and welcome to yet another edition and probably... Uh, the edition that's going to get us put on a government watch list of American Loser, guys. <laughs> if we're not there already. <laughs> exactly. It is the podcast that puts the spotlight firmly on second place. And quite a second place it is here today. Um, uh, my name's K.P. Burke. I used to be a stand-up comic back when that existed in the great state of New Jersey. I still am, just uh, significantly reduced hours. But uh, And my dilf of a dad, Lawrence Patrick Burke, is here with me. How are you, sir? Oh, we're just doing wonderful, Kev. Couldn't be any better. I hear you. And uh, he's uh, he's busy photo- you know, doing photograph duties right now but uh the legend himself the boss the man who owns a shared universe podcast studio in eatontown new jersey ming chen behind the ones and twos what's up everybody <laughs> thank you for being here ming sorry i woke you up early on a sunday yeah. not at all not at all i will i will lo- i will not sleep for a week if i know american <laughs> loser is i was i slept here last night get the feel of the room <laughs> right. you know there you go. slept on the table Always we joke there. but we, we've come in before and uh kahoon has been asleep on the couch oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's that's a different kind of commitment but yes you know, i'll tell you what with today's episode though not only do we have to wipe down for covid precautions but we also have to check the room for bugs and all kinds of government uh, listening devices because this is this is going to be a good one uh yeah it gets a little bit wild here we did bring a couple of tinfoil hats to put on so uh next time somebody tries to tell you that uh, oh what are you like a conspiracy theorist dude eight minutes on wikipedia can change your life <laughs> so um, we're going to dive into this one, too. It's going to have to be over two parts. So uh, we're recording it all in one shot here so that, that way we don't do that redundant um, uh, thing where we have to back the show back up and then retell you the first week. Uh, so we're going to move this thing forward as quickly as possible. But real quick, we do have to get one piece of housekeeping out of the way. Uh, if you do support the show, please check us out over at American Loser Podcast over on Instagram. We're having a lot of fun over there, posting up some weird uh, hi- history memes, stuff like that. Uh, updates about the show go in there as well. And then also the American Loser uh, page uh, on Facebook is starting to get a little bit more traction. I'm learning how to do all that stuff. Uh, you can check me out at KP Burke Sucks over on Instagram and at KP Burke. That's where I'm posting most of my jokes and upcoming show dates and stuff like that over on ye old Facebook because I hate Twitter and that's why I haven't got one. So anyway, all of that being said, uh, in addition, we are now starting to put episodes up onto YouTube. So if you have uh, your YouTube up or something like that, and you're just looking for something in the background, some background noise uh, that occasionally tells you some stories about weird shit in history, you can now check out some of our episodes over there on YouTube. And we got more uh, content moving forward. And of course, if you love this show, which a lot of you do, and we are so grateful for that, uh, for just five bucks a month, that's all we ask for. Just uh, the cost of one large cup of coffee from Dunkin' Donuts, as we proved on our car ride down here today. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you can become a member of uh, the, the Founding Losers, if you will. Now, the Founding Losers are capped off, but we're going to still continue to allow you guys to join the good old Patreon, uh, where, again, for just five bucks a month, uh, you get to keep this show alive here. It uh, gets me to uh, – that money goes to me um, bribing Ming to still be friends with us. Um, that also goes to uh, a couple other production costs, trying to get more promotions and stuff out there. And again, uh, this is a different kind of a podcast. I wish we could just turn on the microphones and go, Dad. But uh, we had to put about, I'd say this week was about six hours of research. It was, it was more than that. But yeah, we're, uh, <laughs> it's one of those rabbit holes that you go down and you just can't seem to crawl back out of. Yeah, you just, holy shit. <laughs> but uh, all again, uh, in conclusion on that one here before we dive into this week's episode and what an episode it's going to be, uh, five bucks a month over on Patreon and all that money goes to us just offsetting the cost of the show that we can continue to do the Tuesday episodes for free. And then you also, in addition to that, get access to the monthly Patreon exclusive, which uh, by the time this episode airs, uh, it's going to be the misunderstood, the often misunderstood War of 1812, Broken Down American Loser Style, this month exclusive on Patreon. So if you go, hey, if you're already signed up, you're going to get that bad boy. And if you haven't signed up yet and you're interested in that, not only do you get that one, you get the back catalog too. So a lot of good stuff in there. Um, 
But Black I want Black Friday special. It, yeah, I November. wish we had a Black Friday special. <laughs> <laughs> you get the back catalog and the most recent episode. Absolutely. Now, and uh, Amazon Prime is not involved, so that's the good news. I mean, hey, maybe they will be one day, Dad. Who knows? Well, we can only hope. You know, we go. how many desks of networks do we have to get on before COVID hits again? So, yeah. uh, I'm excited now. We're going to dive in on this bad boy here because the coffee's working. All right. Um, People don't know this, but uh, we've kind of covered it a little bit on the show here. From as far back as the Jefferson administration, we here in the United States have been a little bit nervous about this uh, certain island off the coast of Florida known as uh, Cuba. Okay. Uh, we got involved in their affairs quite a few times. Uh, hell, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, there's it's not an American Loser episode without a mention of TR. He helped invade it during the Spanish-American War. We kicked Spain out of Cuba and promised many good things to uh, our island nation neighbor, uh, unfortunately, most of it never panned out, and Cuba uh, has this history now of exposing a large black eye on American foreign policy uh, in the region. I mean, it, it's things are contentious to this day, uh, but man, the time frame we're about to talk about is as contentious as it gets. So, and interestingly enough, you are a first-hand source on a lot of this information. <laughs> I don't know about a first-hand source, but lived through it. Well, some of it was alive anyhow. Old fossil Patrick over yeah, here. so <laughs> The old codger. No, man. It's, uh, it's definitely exciting to talk about this one. And again, like you said, there's the stuff that you knew maybe just as a kid trying to pay attention to what's going on uh, or things being recounted to you, uh, rec- uh, you know, explained to you, if you will, by an adult later on. But... Uh, there's a lot going on over here today. Today's loser tale is going to involve the United States of America, Cuba, Russia, JFK, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, the CIA, nuclear weapons, and a total disaster that becomes infamous around the world, known simply as the Bay of Pigs invasion. So without uh, uh, any further ado, I'm going to dive into this one. Um Dad, when you hear Bay of Pigs, what's the first thing that uh, is conjured up in your mind? Well, to me, it goes back to uh, JFK, John F. Kennedy. He's the uh, guy was, always gets attached to, for good reason. Right, for good reason. Uh, although it wasn't really initially cooked up um, by the Kennedy administration, which we'll get into. But, uh, um, yeah, Kennedy was this young, uh, energetic. Uh, everybody is like fawning over JFK, good looking guy, young guy, the youngest president to be elected. And now early on in his administration, we have this uh, this catastrophe known as the Bay of Pigs. It's uh, it's not a good one. Um, again, like we said, this invasion is typically attached to President John F. Kennedy, uh, who is often praised as he should be for his later handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, that is you want to talk about a, a, a great movie, uh, 13 Days, which I believe is starring Kevin Costner, that they really break down how close to the brink of nuclear war we were. Yeah. And it was intense. I mean, old young Larry Burke's hiding underneath his desk as an elementary school kid. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, it was some scary times. I mean, you knew that when the adults were, were this agitated or this concerned that this this is some deep shit going on here, that when we're sending the Navy to uh, encircle uh, Cuba and um, the, the Soviets are sending their ships uh, towards Cuba. You know, what's going to happen when uh, the two meet? Uh, is this going to be World War Three? only this time both sides are using nuclear weapons? That, that's some scary shit. And as an elementary school kid, you've already gone through how many civil defense drills, quote unquote, civil defense drills, which when the air aid signal goes off, uh, you know, get under your desk and put your head between your knees and basically kiss your ass goodbye because it's some scary times as my wonderful environmental science teacher in high school um i'll say his name why not he's uh he's an accomplished guy and i admire him sean spiller um one of he was one of my favorite teachers i had uh growing up uh he wore a cccp hockey jersey into um class one day and i was i wasn't great in environmental science but i was like hey i know uh i was like what's up with the russian shit spiller and um (laughs) He broke down for me that uh, while he was backpacking over in uh, Russia, he noticed that underneath the uh, the subway stations that there were these giant, um, uh, you know, 
bomb shelters, if you will, that that's what the they were that afraid of, um, you know, later President Reagan, but just the threat of the nuclear force here. So you're hiding underneath a, a desk and uh, the, the evil Russians actually are building bomb shelters for their citizens. So it, it's a weird thing. There's a lot of the, the moral um, high ground is painted in various shades of gray depends, throughout today's it story. It depends on who's holding the brush as to what kind of paint job. And then that whole bomb shelter thing, I mean, we're at the uh, the absolute height of the Cold War. I mean, things have been going bad since the end of World War II between um, the the West and, and the Soviets. And, you know, we're, People are building their own bomb, personal bomb shelters in their backyards. Uh, municipalities are building uh, municipal bomb shelters on this side for just in case. All uh, these farmers in Russia keep disappearing. Yeah, I mean it was, uh, and you know we're we're looking at the at the world map as that how many uh, countries worldwide are now flipping to the uh, to the communist uh, to the communist side. So. Um, you know, we're we're definitely at at the height of the Cold War at this point. Yeah, it's a it's a slow thing too, because on both sides you see what would be considered an a paranoid, irrational fear becoming a legitimate rational fear. So it, it gets um gets intense here. So we're gonna try to break this down from both sides. As I said earlier, JFK does get his credit for handling the Cuban Missile Crisis. However, that crisis only really exists or is um accelerated, if you will. In the first place, in large part due to JFK fucking up this absolute botched invasion of Cuba. Uh, Even more interesting, though, as we said, the invasion is not JFK's idea to uh, begin with. So, yeah, JFK uh, was a kind of a stand up guy in accepting the blame for the failed invasion or the Bay of Pigs. Um, But at the same time, uh, when you really start scratching at it, it wasn't JFK's. Uh, um, mis- misguided uh, endeavors here. It was really uh, there was others that uh, came before him that hatched this whole plan and and botched the whole thing. But JFK, you know, the buck stops here. Who's who's in charge here? Well, JFK's in charge. He's he's the head guy, so he's taking the blame for others uh, mis mishandling the situation well where he's fascinating too because i remember uh uh, in third grade i played jfk in a president uh, presentation (laughs) where i i dressed up as him and had to give a speech as him and everything was that your first time on stage kev Uh, might have been (laughs) standing up in front of the class yeah i uh (laughs) much like lee harvey oswald i killed Um, (laughs) there you go but no it was uh so kennedy's always been a fascinating uh person to me but we kind of – grown up as a kid the way that – you know, when I did, I'm 33 years old. Um, I look back at Kennedy and I think of uh, – I mean, he's always held in this position of reverence. Now, how much of that is because he's later assassinated, which we'll get to, and there's a couple of possible links to uh, today's topic and that. Uh, but also, I mean, what, there's moments in his presidency where you're like, this was the right guy for the job. Absolutely. And then there's the uh, the thing of when like someone dies too soon, you're like, what what else could they have done? I mean, did we miss out on a, a better world because this guy was no longer in it? Uh, now, at the time when Kennedy's going to come into uh, uh, the fray here, if you will, there's also this widespread belief held by Khrushchev, held by Fidel Castro uh, and held by almost all critics of Kennedy that this kid's just an idiot, illiterate playboy with a millionaire daddy. All right. So, he's a rich kid. He's a rich kid from Massachusetts that daddy was able to uh, pull some strings and put him into office. So, you know, he's he's untested. I say again, he's a he's a youngster too. I mean, he's the youngest president. That War hero though, PT one hundred nine. Yep, saw so, saw action absolutely, and you know they were playing. I mean, that's why part of the country was in love with the guy. Part of the country was like, oh man, this this isn't going to work out. Yeah, it's a, a, a parallel of sorts, uh, too, would be, um, uh, again, it, I love our theory on the show that it takes 30 years for the emotion, emotional attachments to the current events to then be viewed properly as history in a dispassionate way. Mm-hmm. So I think that's super important. So we get a chance to do that today here. And that's why we're going to be pretty goddamn fair on uh, the breakdown we're about to do here. Uh, back then, the plan to defeat uh, communist Castro Castro was leading a regime in Cuba. This plan, like we said, originally first developed under the Eisenhower administration. So uh, I like Ike. There's um, there's a lot to like about Ike. Uh, 
Yeah, Ike is a is a war hero. He was the commander in chief during the Second World War, and then uh, you know, and supreme Allied commander, supreme supreme. Now uh, he's the at this point. Now he's president. Now he's commander in chief. Okay, all right. Yeah. But uh, he was large and in charge of the whole uh, Second World War for the for the Allies, and uh, you know, he's a, he's a hero. He's he's developing now. We're in in post war uh, America. Things are going great, and the economy's going great. Uh, Ike is, you know, everybody likes Ike. He's a very popular, uh, very popular president. He's putting uh, some stuff into play with our our um, uh, highway system and everything. Uh, he's he's developing America and bringing it more up into the modern world. But at the same time, Ike has a complete understanding of who he's dealing with on the other side of the world with the Soviets because you know they were at odds. They were always cautious. Um, at at the at, during the Second World War, with having the Soviets as allies, that you know, uh, when are we going to turn this thing around against Germany and just turn turn the guns the other way and have to go after Russia? Uh, one of our loser receptions was uh, uh, was Patton, and Patton was all about just keep right on going, go through Germany and go after the Russians right then and there, rather than having to come back in a couple of years and and fight them later on down the road. So, you know, Ike was very, very aware of uh, his, uh, those on the other side of the world that were against democracy, we'll say, the communist side versus the Democrats. We'll take a picture with Papa Joe Stalin, but uh, we also know what he's up to. There's a region they called him the, uh, there's a reason he was known as the butcher of Georgia. Just watch your back. That's, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. Shake his hand, but watch your back. Indeed. Well, so there's a lot of, um, there's some paranoia, there's some anxiety, there's some hesitation, there's some realism all based into this thing. Um, Ike is justifiably uh, fearful of, uh, first of all, Ike and the boys not new to the idea of regime change. Okay. Uh, They're justifiably afraid of this red wave in the emerging Soviet Union. While America enjoys a uh, geographical advantage that keeps them apart from many European affairs, the Russians continue to uh, support smaller countries that are leaning towards communism with this uh, beautiful helping hand, if you will. Uh, The domino theory, which uh, for those who don't know, the domino theory was that when one country falls into uh, to, to, you know, communism that uh, neighboring countries inevitably will be sucked up into it and this is unfortunately on full display so what would start it off is just someone someone guy you know having a paranoid uh the government put chips in my brain kind of a rant like but if 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 hungary falls to this i mean what's going to happen then right and that whole domino theory that was actually from a speech that eisenhower had given that he he was the first one to really coin that whole term and then uh you know over in England, we've got Churchill, and he's talking about the Iron Curtain that we have the the Soviets and the, and the Iron Curtain that you know Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, um, Poland, all of these various countries in Eastern European have already fallen under the Soviet regime. We've got North Korea going communist. We've got uh, North Vietnam going communist. Uh, and th- this whole red wave is is spreading, and um, they're completely at odds with uh, with the West. So, um, you know, it, again, we're in the middle of the of this Cold War. It's uh, it's getting wild. The, the Eastern European countries, China, other parts of Asia, everybody's all falling around to that. Now we're kind of I'm not saying we're ignoring that, but we're not as threatened about that until the good old call of communism starts uh, like a Jehovah's Witness <laughs> knocking on the doors of uh, some of our Latin American counterparts right, here. You're getting a little close to our shores. It's not just uh, on the other side of the ocean. It's uh, now it's uh, in our own backyard. And, you know, and, and we're not uh, putting aside either the, the whole uh, incursion into Africa. So, I mean, it's it's worldwide. It's, uh, you know, they're, we're, we're feeling that uh, the this whole Soviet uh, communist thing is going to be a, a worldwide uh, 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 attempt at dominance worldwide. So, so and, the, yep, yeah. they're, they're ringing the doorbells, uh, like I said, Jehovah's Witness style. Uh, ding dong. Do you have a moment or two to discuss with us our Lord and Savior, Karl Marx? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the U.S. has um, interests secured in Central America uh, many years ago in uh, what we covered in depth on this show and just got we got actually excellent um critical feedback on this because every now and then on this show 
this is we're in a great spot. We're a comedy show. We're an entertainment show. We're a storytelling show, but we're a history show. And if you try to sell us as a history show, they'd be like, ah, yeah, you know, you guys aren't really going in depth on anything. It's like, yeah, this is history for the common man. And then if we try to be a comedy show, they're like, yeah, you guys are always trying to teach me some shit. So we can't please anybody. <laughs> right. So, right. <laughs> but um, we try to make history fun. How's that? Exactly. <laughs> but we, we landed a, an absolute home run in one of my favorite episodes uh, of the guy who, during the aforementioned Banana Wars, uh, really kind of publicly outed what was going on in the world. And that is uh, Captain America himself, Smedley Butler, who uh, a personal hero of mine in, in discovering him uh, for the show. He had famously explained that war is a racket and, uh, you know, mentioned he goes, well, I'm fighting, you know, American men are dying for corporate interests back in America. This is not what we're signing up for. We're here to defend uh, liberty and uh, we want to be, you know, ensure that the if there is a war, it's being fought for the right reasons, not so that the United Fruit Company, who's going to be a big factor in here today, mm -hmm. uh, can continue to uh, put uh, some pluses in the, uh, the, you know, the, the margins. Right. American business interests. And for those listeners who haven't listened to it yet, Smedley Butler was a highly decorated Marine that uh, – was involved with many uh, uh, incursions into worldwide, uh, and as I say, a very highly decorated uh, Marine hero. That uh, um, we went into his his story in a previous episode. So check that one out. I'll put that one up on the the YouTube next. But uh, again, the uh, United Fruit Company is heavily involved as landowners in the region of Central uh, America. Um, that there's we don't really get into South America just just yet here, but. Uh, we're definitely making sure that uh, things for the American viewpoint. And again, why wouldn't you want that? Be like, hey, let's make sure the neighbors are all kind of on our side. Let's make sure we have agreeable neighbors. Right. That's what you want to do here. It's uh, in a sense, they're uh, enforcing homeowner association fees at gunpoint. But uh, again, the United Fruit Company is going to become super important here because they're heavily known as uh, landowners in the region and they're benefiting and profiting quite handsomely from the produce market. So throughout the, yeah, throughout the Caribbean and they, they get their start early on and back in the uh, late 18, uh, 18, uh, 80s, 1890s, that type of a thing. And that whole banana, we, today we go into the, any supermarket, you can get bananas anytime, anywhere kind of a thing. But uh, back in that time frame, that was a relatively new thing. Uh, the banana really started in, in Costa Rica and then uh, that developed it um, to the point where now it's um, being cultivated um, throughout the, the Caribbean and, and, and Latin America. And the United Fruit Company is making large dollars. I mean, they're they're a huge American corporation or company that is making big bucks. Unfortunately, they're making big bucks off of uh, other other governments, other besides or setting up governments or being very. Uh, What's up with you conspiracy theorists? You conspiracy <laughs> yeah. theorists are crazy. Go tell Queen Lila yeah. Ukalani about that when uh, the Dole's Fruit Company decides to overthrow their entire kingdom, as covered on yeah, this show. Yeah, United Fruit was involved with Hawaii as well. So there, we, we, there's so many loose receptions here of previous episodes that it's just uh, the coming together of so many different uh, aspects that, with this whole Bay of Pigs thing that uh, really the Bay of Pigs can be backed up into into the United Fruit Company with the Banana Wars and Smedley Butler and a number of others that are involved with this. Oh, yeah. Now, again, so we know that Bay of Pigs fails because it's the topic of, uh, you know, American Loser this week. But uh, originally the plan, which was considered a can't miss, uh, got first kind of rolled out in a, a precursor to this, the prequels, to give a Star Wars reference here. Uh, the prequels is, um, is an interesting thing here known as Operation Success. Now, Operation Success is implemented as a sort of sign of things to come with Cuba. OK, uh, so to we're not jumping into Cuba just yet. We want to let you guys know what the groundwork is for why this idea is. So this is as close to a deep dive. Typically, we reserve this for the Patreons. But you know what? The good people of America need to know about this shit. <laughs> really? Really? I mean, uh, yeah, there was a lot of eye openers for me on, on, on research in this particular episode. And yeah, thought, you started smoking cigarettes during your research. I was getting concerned. <laughs> yeah, getting a little nervous. Yeah, you had pictures of uh, all the main players up on the wall, and you were like, hey, they're connected, but how, Kevin? <laughs> putting the tinfoil on the windows and everything else to uh, keep the government out. Finkel is Einhorn. Um, <laughs> in 1954, Guatemalan President Jacobo or Jacobo Arbenz 
was a popular and democratically elected leader of the emerging nation. Arbenz had implemented a policy of land redistribution. If the land was not being cultivated, meaning that it was just kind of sitting there, okay, there's not an active farm on it, it was being seized by the government and redistributed to the poor landless farmers in hopes of building what Guatemala had never had in a wealthy farmer class. Okay, this idea sounds great on paper, especially if you're a landless farmer. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say wealthy farmer class, but at least a, a middle class farmer class. We're trying to we're trying to develop something that would approach a middle class kind of a thing because Guatemala at at that particular point in time is either very very rich or very very dirt poor, and um, it's really the very very poor are the. Uh, indigenous people of uh, Guatemala, which is primarily the Mayans, which the Spanish had a long history with uh, mm, of destroying mm. the Mayan culture. So um, we're, we're going with the, the natives versus the uh, Johnny Camelilis who are taking over the whole thing. Yeah, Spain does uh, get um, off the hook a lot when it comes to uh, uh, being, you know, plagued with genocides and uh, mass murders and uh, imperialism, all that other stuff, because they kind of declined in power. Right. And, then, and then really, they're kind of the Jersey Shore of uh, Europe, too. So it's like, uh, Spain, didn't you guys completely annihilate mass amounts of Native Americans? What are you talking about? We're from Ibiza. We're having a great time. Come on my boat. <laughs> so, yeah. And, uh, and, and by 1954, the... Um, um, the, the fruit company has d developed this whole banana thing into a, a huge worldwide distribution. Um, bananas, which were kind of a remote and, and a small part of uh, a worldwide food food goods, foodstuffs, is now like number four behind rice and a few of the others. So that it, it's it's a product that everybody is going after, and a very select few are controlling this, mm -hmm. this world market between Dole and United Fruit Company and a number of others. And uh, uh, again, a lot of this information, first of all, you can pull up a lot of this just doing some good Wikipedia research. Uh, you can also pull it up. I mean, there's very, we try to have multiple sources for uh, our, our stuff here, but a quick shout out, if I can, to uh, uh, Sandy Burke, uh, my beautiful mother, who... <laughs> Found in uh, Ollie's in Maryland or Virginia? I think it was Maryland. Uh, a book called <laughs> Failures of the Presidents by uh, Thomas J. Crowell. Uh, and let me tell you what a fantastic book that is. Again, the title is Failures of the Presidents, Thomas J. Crowell. And we literally pulled uh, a ton of our research from this one. It, it almost uh, little chapters just on everything. And this is considered the biggest failure of Kennedy's presidency. Right. So that's why uh, I'm excited to break this down. But again, this is the stuff going on before Kennedy's even, I mean, this actually, to be in, in truth, I believe the original plan for what we're about to talk about starts under uh, President Harry S. For nothing Truman. Well, the, there was certainly interest in uh, throughout the Caribbean and Central America and Latin, you know, in South America. And Harry Truman, we're post-World War II again. So, you know, we're, we're keeping our eye on the, on the whole world and especially uh, what's on our, in our hemisphere. And, we weren't really liking the way things were, were going in Guatemala, but at least we had the United Fruit Company kind of keeping keeping control over the whole Guatemala thing. But then when this uh, new president, Arbenz, comes into power and he starts redistributing, um, he was take Arbenz's plan was to take uncultivated uh, land that might have been owned by the extremely rich, the United Fruit Company being part of it. And then redistributing it to the farmers who had no land. So it was just a, an opportunity for the have nots to have a little something. A parallel to that being how the United States government would routinely sell land whenever they needed to pay off their own deficits early on. Right. So uh, it, it's the government distributing the lands on that one. That, that really is um, there's not much of a, a gray area on that. But I thought this was worth mentioning, too. Again, this idea sounds great on paper, but the policy incurs the wrath of the aforementioned uh, United Fruit Company, whose lands are being redistributed. Now, that's the whole thing. You want to talk about property and ownership. There is a thing with that. Should a government be able to take away your property? That That's a legit argument. Right. Okay. Or but, does, does taking away the property from... Uh, who somebody who has and giving it to a have not and that starts to smell a little bit like socialism right? that starts to smell a little bit like Marxist and and oh my god the dreaded word communist that uh, 
uh, that ain't that ain't too cool here. That uh, we can't be having that shit. That uh, this is mine and I'm keeping it. Uh, it doesn't matter who it belonged to originally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, socialism can sometimes be uh, considered the Marilyn Manson CD that leads to your goth phase of communism. So um, yeah, and we've already seen uh, you know countries throughout the world who uh, have gone to that whole socialist communist. Uh, Marxist kind of uh, leanings, and uh, we're not going to let it. We're not going to let that happen in in Guatemala, no, no matter what the good intentions are of this uh, democratically elected uh, president uh, Arbenz. Oh yeah, especially anybody in a leadership position uh, is still wary of the shit that just went down in Russia at the end of World War One. So there's a lot of legitimate fear in this. People are alive still during these time frames. And with that being said. Uh, the United Fruit Company begins to petition and lobby to the U.S. to intervene. This includes <laughs> this no. one fucked me up, man. Uh, one of the United Fruit Company's moves would be including hiring a publicist. OK, the publicist's job was to create a negative uh, image of what's going on in the Guatemalan government and to portray the United Fruit Company in a more sympathetic light. And this particular publicist happened to be a pretty esteemed guy. Maybe he's a relative of Sigmund Freud. OK, maybe his great grandson is the first CEO of Netflix. Confirmed that one the other day. Edward Bernays, loserception. OK, Edward Bernays, the guy who pretty much created marketing and public relations. And by the way, just took the name propaganda and changed it. That's all he did. He literally he. <laughs> he was a public relations guy for propaganda. How great is that? Yeah, right. But they hired Bernays. Bernays, as always, extremely effective here. And President Harry S. for nothing Truman. Uh, S. for nothing, by the way, this is a tribute to my grandmother, good old Grammy Burke, who used to call him that. <laughs> no, no, it was my, actually your great-grandmother, but that's all right. Hey, man, I still laugh every time I say it. Anyhow. <laughs> um, but uh, Truman acts on behalf of the United Fruit Company. Um, and by the way, United Fruit Company, how funny is that? that uh, that's UFC. These are the original UFC fighters, <laughs> the United Fruit Company. <laughs> there you go. While also being justifiably concerned by the socialist and communist leanings of these new leaders, uh, Truman decides he is going to start to maybe get an idea of something to go here. The name of the campaign was Operation Fortune, and it lasted about as long as my hot streak with football picks. So, Which is not good. I win once every now and again, guys. Uh, having been launched in 1952, the operation was quickly scraped in the final months of the Truman presidency. Yeah, I think once again, too, it's interesting that we, we've got one uh, administration going out and the next administration is inheriting what somebody else had yep. already started. So <laughs> Harry Truman starts this whole Guatemalan campaign um, to, you know, to discredit the, the Guatemalan presidency. And then Ike comes in and he kind of takes over that whole Guatemalan, uh, you know, things go on at that time. The clock what is a great still transition, though, to go from the Supreme Allied Commander to uh, the presidency. That's got to be in wartime. I mean, these guys knew each other. They worked very well with each other towards, right. the, the, toward the very end of the war. So a very interesting uh, transitional time period for uh, the presidency at this particular juncture. Yeah, and, and I think it's interesting to note, too, that we're going from a, a president in Truman who uh, – Served in the military, he was in, involved with World War One, and now we're going to uh, uh, Eisenhower, who's the Allied uh, Supreme mm -hmm. Commander. That uh, you know, certainly a military-minded guy um, uh, in his uh, in his presidency. So, you know, what what's what are you going to do if you're a military-minded guy? Uh, how are you going to handle that situation? Again, so, former Supreme Allied Commander, uh, a war hero general, American hero, an accomplished golfer, Dwight Eisenhower, right. uh, is now Ike's in. He's going to take a determined hardline stance against the rise of communism. Ike had a uh, secretary of state that was similarly minded in a guy by the name of John Foster Dulles. Uh, Ming, if you've ever flown into Washington, D.C., have you? Uh, many times, yes. I know uh, the airport, um, which uh, well, which I first saw in Die Hard 2, Die Harder. <laughs> there you go. That's where I first saw that airport, if you're not familiar with it. Yep. Well, Dulles Air uh, Airport, man, which is fascinating because that is, um, that's named after John Foster Dulles. So uh, Dulles is going to be, again, the Secretary of State for Ike. And uh, he would later have an airport in D.C. named after him. Dulles and his brother, Alan, who in an earlier episode we – uh, had the we were not correct on that, that Alan Dulles 
who would become uh, the director of the CIA. He is not who the airport's named after. It was named after his brother. His brother dies in 1959 of very bad colon cancer, I believe. But when he died, he was a, a very widely respected um, gentleman. And he was also considered a pioneer of a technique known as brinkmanship. You know what brinkmanship is, Dad? No, you're going to have to lay that one out for me. Brinkmanship is fucking fascinating because you saw it recently. And ju- I'm not even saying this in some sort of an advocate way. But you saw it recently in the hardline negotiations between uh, the Trump administration and a couple other global powers of people are sitting there like I had friends of mine, friends who are calm, rational people that are sitting like, oh, fuck, we're about to go to World War Three right now. And it was always scaled back that it was all of a sudden North Korea is not really an issue anymore. All of a sudden, we're, you know, things calm down with Iran or whatever. And brinkmanship is pushing a situation. And this is one of the things that this oh, guy was okay. known. You push things to the absolute brink and then pull them back at the last minute. Now, that is also a little bit of foreshadowing for what's going to vindicate JFK and his Cuba negotiations towards the later half of the second episode here. But brinkmanship being a thing done by John Foster Dulles. Him and his brother, Alan, both very cunning men, geopolitical experts with a deep fear and hatred of the commies. So his brother, Alan, like I said, will eventually become the director of the CIA and was engaged in several other coups where we did regime change prior to Bay of Pigs. Right. And also happened to sign off on a little project known as MK Ultra. Yeah. Uh, the, the Dulles boys, uh, Alan and his Alan is the CIA director under Eisenhower. And uh, John uh, John Foster Dulles, his brother, is the Secretary of State for Eisenhower. So we've got a, a heavy, <laughs> we have a heavy Dulles influence on the Eisenhower administration. Imagine sure. being Alan Dulles' secretary and there's just him walking into the office and hanging his coat and jacket up. And he goes like, oh, what do we have today? Just, well, at uh, 1030, you have to give uh, syphilis to the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, <laughs> then we're going to be testing acid on unsuspecting CIA operatives. Uh, and then in addition to that, too, we're actually going to be th- overthrowing the regime in Cuba. So you have a very busy day today, but you can still fit in tea time at nine if you start. In- <laughs> yeah. We'll hit the links. And- and let's not forget the Congo and uh, uh, Guatemala. And well, there's a lot of different things. Iran. Going on. He, he had a he had a full he had a full uh, oh yeah f- full roster. The uh, the, the CIA uh, is not your friend, um, but and I, and again, just thrown back to previous episodes, I thought it was interesting. A little tidbit that I found that uh, CIA director Alan Dulles. Um, was a Yale graduate and also a member of the Skull and Bone Society, which we had a couple of other losers that, no. <laughs> that were belonged to that same Skull fraternal and Bones. organization. You mean Paul Giamatti's crew? <laughs> yeah. That well, will always make me laugh. John Kerry and George W. Bush, both members of Skull and Bones, both ran against each other, both refused to mention anything about the club. And then Paul Giamatti almost won an Academy Award for uh, whatever that wine movie was that he made back then. <laughs> that was a, a big couple of years for Skull and Bones, boy. There you go. But um, so Dulles uh, is an interesting guy in, I mean, both Dulles brothers really are fascinating, but uh, they're engaged in several other coups, like we were saying. MK Ultra's on there too. John Foster and Alan, uh, both Dulles boys, both are alleged to have ties to the United Fruit Company. Uh, both are now holding high positions in the Eisenhower administration, and both are staunch anti communists. So, yeah, I think it was not alleged, it was. Uh both brothers are a lawyer, have lawyer backgrounds. Um, they're um, within the law firm that represents the United Fruit Company and are also on the United Fruit Company's board of directors. So they're they're large and in charge. They're it's, not uh, large and in charge, but at least they're they're in the uh, if there's a meeting of 10 people, they're, they're in the room. Yeah, they're sitting in the owner's box. Right. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Um, so. Now, the idea is here that you can start to make some impact if you uh, you have the threat of the American military force, which is uh, considered the finest in the world at this point. All right. That was definitely a thing that held Russia back from really wanting to fuck with us. Um, we have a, a absolutely superior Navy, still the best in the world. Um, a little psychological warfare could start to get employed here. There's a lot of tactics that can get moved um, into this thing. So uh, now they're nervous about Arbenz and they're deciding that they're going to get involved with uh, overthrowing him and maybe installing somebody a little bit more pro-America over there because they're getting nervous about the idea that if Guatemala falls, the other countries in this domino theory are also going to start to fall. And now we've destabilized our neighbors. So the same way that the European countries are all very anxious about their affairs, like, hey, Germany seems to be marching a lot lately. Should we be nervous about that? 
Um, also, quick shout out to our buddies over in Switzerland. Now we have listeners over in Switzerland and uh, a lot of listeners in Adelaide, Australia. So I plan on moving there in the near future. There you go. Um, yeah, get, get that Aussie accent. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know hopefully on a woman, but I mean I'll take it. It's, <laughs> Whatever. It's, <laughs> but uh, so. What they're going to do is they're going to have a combined joint effort here. This is very interesting. So there's a naval blockade of Guatemala that they will combine with the launching of anti-communist radio shows. So on the islands uh, and small outposts off the coast of Guatemala or or in the outside regions of Guatemala, uh, they're now going to be having uh, freedom radio. Right. So imagine getting that phone call really, hey, we need you to do a podcast about how the people of Guatemala should stand up to their government and uh, we're just going to play it 24-7. I want you, essentially what they want is they want you to go – they're trying to hire um, – uh, a captivating radio personality to just sit there. It was called Freedom Radio, I believe. Yeah, well, there was, there was, uh, there was that was around the world. Again, it was uh, America's idea that we were going to have Radio Free Europe, so we're broadcasting into Europe, into the communist bloc uh, in Europe. That you know, they those people were again they, that whole Iron Curtain idea of Churchill's was that they're not getting any news other than what the the Communist Party is telling them. So it was an attempt to. You know, bring in some uh, different opinions, if you will. And th- that was not only just Radio Free Europe, but also in Latin America and in the Caribbean and throughout the world. So, yeah, yeah. They're, they're bombarding uh, Guatemala with, oh, via the radio waves uh, as to, you know, America's got your back and all, all the all the positives and, uh, uh, you know, government sponsored uh, pirate you're, radio. <laughs> right. Right. Your, your president, your president is uh, not so good. And, uh, you know, just putting down um, whatever um, programs that uh, um, he was trying to put into place for the for the people, if you will. And, you know, the, the people of Guatemala had to realize that there's there's somebody big behind all of this. So there was a, a veiled threat that, uh, you know, if you don't go our way, that uh, there's going to be reprisals to uh, to your country. Oh, yeah. And uh, it, it's happening slowly in front of their eyes here. It's uh, now this naval blockade is in, uh, in, you know, in effect. Well, actually, extremely effective. And uh, the Arbenz regime is uh, having this radio show telling its listeners at all times to oppose them and that they're not good and that the it's inevitable that the United States government's going to be landing soon. And uh, the most effective weapon was this uh, psychological warfare here, which was used to weaken the morale of the Guatemalan people. You don't necessarily need to fire them up into a frenzy where the Guatemalan people are taking action. You just need to uh, demotivate them to the point of where they would take inaction, where they say, oh, well, the Americans are coming. So might as well just stand up against this. You know, oh, our Ben's he, he's really not a great guy. It's to get them disinterested. That's yeah. the key. Now, Guatemalan President Arbenz, I mean, he was trying, I think, help, trying to help his people. But at the same time, he did have some socialists and communists and Marxists within his administration, if you will. And that didn't sit too well with uh, Eisenhower and the um, U.S. administration. And then uh, he goes and, and buys some uh, weapons from Czechoslovakia, which was at that time part of uh, the Soviet bloc. And that was that really just kind of clinched the deal that we got to we got to oust this guy because now he's actually buying from the uh, weapons from the communists. So where is he going with this? His leanings towards uh, the communist side is just way too much that uh, he's, he's got to be taken out. Now, again, a democratically elected, very popular leader in yeah. this Arbenz guy. And uh, there's a lot of uh, murals and stuff like that still to this day in Guatemala that uh, portray him as a. Uh, um, uh, the same way that Kennedy gets uh, um, put into sainthood because of uh, what could have been. Arbenz, I don't believe, is assassinated. I, I think he has to go into hiding kind of a thing. But uh, you have this, all of this stuff going on here in conjunction with the CIA training and arming the resistance militia under the leadership of a fellow by the name of Castillo Armas and his force of just under 500 men. That's important, by the way, under 500 guys. Yeah, just 500 guys. But with all this radio broadcasting and all this propaganda that's going on, um, it, they're, you know the people of Guatemala are led to believe that it's going to be a whole lot more than just 500 guys. And uh, um, Armas is uh, actually a military guy. He's, he's a Guatemalan. And he's leading this revolution, if you will, against the uh, against the president. So, um, 
uh, with the uh, with the idea of uh, you know the American is going to come and um, help out oust the president. Now, it's really not so much that uh, you know America is, is going to be uh, benefiting the people, but um, this new guy Armas um, is going to create a coup within Guatemala that's going to be more friendly to American business interests. Because we've already had a, a democratically elected president mm-hmm. in Guatemala, but <laughs> he's the wrong kind of democratically elected president. He's one that's for the people and not so much for the United Fruit Company. So <laughs> there we go. Let's get somebody in there that's going to be uh, a little more favorable to American business. American business interests in Guatemala at that time, they, they probably – are controlling, I would say, fifty to sixty percent of their uh, of their economy. I mean, bananas and fruit were that were that big within Guatemala at that time. Oh, totally. So, it's uh, the ten percent that's owning ninety percent of uh, of the wealth. And there is and uh, again the vast no majority middle of class. That, yeah, and then the vast majority of that ten percent that owns all the wealth are foreign interests. It's not Guatemalans themselves. Yep. So it, it's a justifiable fight here. And uh, Arbenz is trying to do the right thing. Uh, who knows what he could have accomplished had we not you know, interfered here. But with U.S. bombers aiding the efforts of Castillo Armas on the ground, who, again, were armed and trained by the CIA, Armas is able to execute the coup d'etat. Uh, the move is panned internationally and is considered the death blow to Guatemalan sovereignty but it was a success on paper for the United States yeah. because we got we got the guy we were worried about out and a guy we can rely on in this regime change thing. That that really is um, if you want to talk about a, a black eye on um, uh, American foreign policy, we we tend to meddle. And, and that's the weird thing. Then we meddle somewhere and then we're just like, we don't understand why you guys hate us. Right. You know, so it's kind of a weird thing there. But Guatemala uh, in the ensuing years would see, by the way, this guy, Armas, he winds up coming into power now. And he is uh, essentially a military dictator. He suspends the constitution, uh, completely destroys any civil liberties that the people of Guatemala were enjoying. Regular routine human rights violations under a military dic- uh, dictatorship where he one of his first actions was to suspend elections. Mm-hmm. This leads to an eventual civil war. But United Fruit's OK with it because we're still getting, you know, uh, you know, we're still raking we're able to mark bucks. up, uh, you know, right. a, a, a dozen bananas. So. Uh, so Why? I'll ask you this, Dad. Why, when faced with a similar problem, wouldn't we just use the similar solution? I mean, you drew up a good play. It worked in the playoffs. Why not try it in the Super Bowl? <laughs> That's it. That's right. It worked once. It worked again. And it wasn't just it worked once. This this was working in, in a number of different situations throughout the world. And uh you know, if, if that's the play that worked for uh, Guatemala, um, and it's worked in other areas. Maybe we weren't sending in troops, but um, we were certainly sending in, uh, uh, how do we put it politely, advisors or supporters or uh, whatever um, to support various dictators or uh, military uh, minded folks that uh, are going to control their their governments. Uh, hey, if it works here, it'll work someplace else too. So let's keep that playbook. Well, that next place happens to be the island of Cuba, which, as we mentioned, has been uh, a part of a big part of why the Monroe Doctrine got mentioned too. That's where, for those who don't know, the Monroe Doctrine was essentially just letting uh, the European powers know. Uh, If you guys try to develop any colonies uh, within the United States on our continent or nearby, uh, we intend to defend ourselves against that because that will be considered and viewed as an act of aggression. So, yeah, and that was later, uh, I think, uh, amped up, too, with uh, with Truman, that uh, Truman was laying down the drawing the line in the sand, too, that you're not going to have any more incursions of any uh, foreign powers, whatever their political viewpoints are in the. In the Western Hemisphere, so hell, not even uh, Western Hemisphere, and it's big too because we're thinking about just that stuff over there on the coast. The Japanese actually invaded the Aleutian Islands in World War II. A lot of people don't even know right, that. So right. they did invade the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, again, this particular island we're going to be talking about here, and we're going to set up the political stuff for this one, and then in uh, the the second part of this episode. Uh, we're going to then uh, discuss the invasion itself. So uh, I hope you guys will listen to the the primer for this, uh, which is what this episode really is. Uh, the year is 1959. 1959 sees the successful overthrowing of presidential dictator Batista from uh, power in Cuba by rising star Fidel Castro. 
So yeah, Fidel Castro is the is the rebel in the hills, mm-hmm. and he's able to uh, overthrow uh, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Yeah, that's it. It's all about who's covering you in the press. Right, There's a lot right. of good stuff here, important shit too. Who's doing your PR? <laughs> Well, PR comes into this. Yeah, and absolutely. Again, Edward does. Bernays absolutely. is not alone. <laughs> um, Castro is at first uh, lauded as the hero to the Cuban people. Uh, Batista was a bit of a tool for the capitalists. He definitely actually not even a bit of a tool. I believe 50 percent of um, their economy uh, and, and the, the, the profit thereof was owned by, again, American foreign interests. So you're getting raped for half your natural resources by guys who don't even live in the country. That's a bit of right. a point of concern. But Batista didn't really do much about that. He let them operate how they wanted to. And in return, the, you know, the U.S. kind of backed Batista. Yeah, and just to back, uh, to back that story up a little bit, too, it was Batista who came into power within Cuba with some American backing. Um, so he, he comes into – he's the revolutionary – you know, previous to this. So Batista is a revolutionary. He overcomes the government that was in place in Cuba at that time uh, with uh, some American uh, help, U.S. help. But, you know, it's a totally corrupt government that uh, although American business interests are making a large, a large amounts of money, Batista is just taking the vig. He's taking his his <laughs> taking ten, <the> vig. <laughs> he's taking his he's taking his 10 percent off the top or whatever. Uh, so he's being paid um, and his corrupt government is being paid. Um you know, um, Batista, I mean, we, if you're watching the movie uh, Godfather 2 with uh, the mob coming into into Cuba, Cuba was going to be the uh, the, the playground of the, of the Caribbean and the mob was going to control that. They're setting up all kinds of casinos and, and Batista's people are going around and collecting. As I say, they're collecting the vig that uh, uh, through through all the casinos. So they're Meanwhile, allowed to Bugsy operate. Siegel stops to take a piss somewhere in Nevada and goes, I got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Well, it's uh, it's worth mentioning, too, here that uh, in addition to allowing so much of the natural exports of Cuba to be developed uh, by corporations and not by the country itself, the major factor in why we tolerated Batista and threw him a little bit of U.S. support here is because the boy is a firm anti-communist. So, again, Cuba, about 90 miles off the shore of Miami, I believe. Yeah, right. So, ninety miles. Nine, uh, Cuba is ninety miles from. Yeah, uh, that's Key one West, one cigarette boat ride away from a mojito, as Colin Farrell proved in uh, Miami Vice, the there movie. Um, this uh, is going to allow him certain leeway with uh, American businesses and uh, political policies. Right. I mean, we knew he was corrupt. We knew he was uh, he was a bad guy, but he's at least protecting American interests, and he's a staunch anti-communist. So. Uh, you know he he's gonna play he's gonna play as long as he's his pockets are still being lined, uh, he's he's playing to uh, our tune so we're dancing to our tune so well with a a very uh, interesting slogan um, Castro comes out with known as a uh, Cuba C Yankee No, um, which is like how about Cuba gets um, how about Cuba eats first for a change, pretty rational position to be in here right yeah now now Fidel too he was uh, he was involved with. Uh, Cuban history before just Batista because there was a, a previous uprising. We've always had rebels in the hills. I think there was even a line in, in The Godfather about we've always had rebels in the hills mm-hmm. in, in Cuba kind of a thing. Whatever the, whatever the uh, administration is in Cuba, there was always somebody looking to overthrow it. Uh, it's got a, a wild and, and crazy uh, history. But uh, uh, Fidel manages, Fidel Castro manages to get himself uh, out of Cuba and escapes really to uh, to Mexico um, with his brother, uh, and then meets up with a couple of other guys that are going to come into the into focus in a little bit here. Um, but then he kind of sneaks back into the country, into Cuba, and he's now the rebel in the hills, and he's able to overthrow uh, some of Batista's uh, forces militarily um, by being the revolution. He's the, he's the big hero now coming in to put down uh, this corrupt government of, of Batista. Um, so he's seen as a a beacon of light that maybe uh, we're going to get rid of this corrupt government in Cuba and we're really going to find somebody now that's going to uh, do the right thing for the people of Cuba. And the key here is that he is apolitical at this time frame, that he still he doesn't come out. We don't know that he's going to be a problem until it's almost too late. Right. 
Right. Yeah, he's he's at this point he's viewed as he's the uh, Cuban freedom fighter that he's he's fighting for the for the benefit of the, of the Cubans. I mean, even his slogan Cuba C, so everything is for Cuba. Um, but well, he's a regular he's James Connolly if you're an Irish history fan. <laughs> yeah, there so. you go. There you go. To uh, to our four listeners in Ireland, one of whom I think is my ex girlfriend, just making sure I'm doing okay. Um, <laughs> But as we're wrapping up this part of uh, this this first section of the episode here, I do want to hit this one thing. We're going to end on the uh, the political climate here, and then the second part of this episode will be specifically on the invasion itself. But um, he's now got it, Castro's in power here. He's got a chance to right the wrongs, if you will. Um, and one of his first moves, though, in developing economic independence is to nationalize, a.k.a. seize, the sugar and mining industries and begins his own land reforms. Where does that sound familiar from? Yeah, that's uh, that's not that's not what we had in mind here. I mean, hey, wait a minute, you're fighting for the Cubans. OK, we can go along with that. But wait a minute, you're going to uh, be taking away American interests, business interests. You're taking away our our uh, our money here. And it wasn't just uh, sugar and everything else. So let's not forget Bacardi rum. <laughs> that, uh, yes. Bacardi was originally made in Cuba. And then cattle they export had to, as well. They had to flee uh, Cuba. Uh, once Castro took over and had to go to uh, uh, Puerto Rico. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Go hang out with Jonathan Pelez and the boys, right? There you go. So Castro quickly makes himself an enemy to American business interests on the island. Many Cubans themselves uh, are also, um, uh, you know, a little bit against this guy here. If you're a wealthy Cuban, you're all of a sudden like, man, this guy's, uh, I don't really like what this guy's doing. That's that thing. They always say um, voting with your feet. Is a big thing. So you can tell how the people felt about uh, Castro because so many uh, Cubans all of a sudden are like, all right, well, I'm going to go spend some time and I'm going to winter in uh, Miami, I think. Yeah. And literally, they thought they were going to be back soon because they, they assumed that maybe Castro was either going to get stopped or that an overthrow was going to happen of some sort. So they literally left and they're like, all right, just keep the house in decent shape. We'll be back eventually. And right. They left, those, the, they left their possessions. Yeah. They're on like their third or fourth generation right, now right, in right, Miami. Right. But uh, the Cubans themselves are getting nervous about this. And also we're attracting the attention of one President Eisenhower. Uh, Ike's got a legit beef with an island so close to the U.S. being communist and even worse, having the opportunity to be friendly with Russia. Yeah. Now, Fidel himself, Fidel Castro, as you say, was not really uh, strong on, on the political side one way or the other. But a lot of the people, a lot of the revolutionaries that he was fighting with, certainly did have very strong political viewpoints. And that was the scary part, that w which way is this guy going to go now? And when he starts taking away uh, American business interests and Cuban business interests, um, it wasn't just, you know, foreign um, business interests that he's taken over. He's taken over everything. And, you know, it's now going to be back to the, to the central government, if you will. Uh, he's running the show. Well, here's how wild things get. Uh, and, and again, we're uh, we're wrapping up here on the first part of this episode. But this is important to break down because I couldn't believe this shit. Um, 1959. Tensions are certainly going to mount quickly. In 59, when Castro had come to power, uh, he hired a publicist and arrived in America, specifically New York City, wearing his green fatigues and his trademark beard uh, like a rock star hero. OK, because that's what happens when you hire an American publicist. They certainly there's even a photo op of uh, of Castro with a bunch of little kids and the little kids are all wearing fake Castro beards. Like it's like, oh, look at uh, communist Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. And that, that beard. Thing. He wasn't a commie yet either, to be clear. But yeah. But but that beard thing, too, that became like his uh, trademark that while he's a revolutionary up in the mountains, uh, he decided, well, if, if it takes 15 minutes every day for me to shave, I'm not going to shave because that's time better spent for the for the revolution to uh, to forward the progress of the of the Cuban people kind of a thing. And uh, that became like a trademark that to have a, a beard like Fidel, uh, like one of the revolutionaries, that was a, a very positive uh, image that he's trying to portray. So he's trying yeah, to be Cuban Abe Lincoln. So when he when he first overthrows Batista, he's looked at as a as a national hero to a lot of the people and he comes to america and people are applauding him for overthrowing the corrupt batista government um he's interviewed on uh on late night television with uh, jack parr uh i mean he's he's a celebrity of sorts um coming to america coming to new york the first time that he he arrived in oh, new yeah. york uh, had an appearance on ed sullivan show too where it's uh what's on tonight on ed sullivan could be the beatles could be the leader of you know cuba we yeah don't know. it could be and anything. it's not and he did he was on ed sullivan as well mm -hmm. so that uh 
You know, and Ed Sullivan introduced him as a fine young man kind of thing, very similar to the way uh, uh, Ed Sullivan introduced him. A couple of good-looking boys from <laughs> Liverpool and yeah. a future communist dictator who's going to execute his own police force. <laughs> right. Uh, Make some noise for... But Yeah. Let's let's hear it. Well, his a return really big, a really big show. <laughs> <laughs> well, his return to New York City about a year later. This is how quickly uh, public opinion can sour on somebody. His return to New York City for a UN function about a year later, after having nationalized the country's resources and forcing many Cubans into leaving or being exiled to Miami and uh, the greater Florida area, other countries, as you said, to uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, Cuba has a diaspora that's pretty interesting. Similar to uh, my mother's home country of Armenia. Um, Castro is now greeted with more and more caution. Uh, upon arrival, upon landing, there's a heightened security detail. Uh, there was also proposed or purported, I should say, improper treatment by the hotel that he was staying at. The hotel demanded that the Cuban delegation pay a $10,000 cash advance uh, because, well, we hear you Cubans are a little bit wild. So we just want to make sure that we have a security deposit against damages you might uh, uh, you know, force onto the, the hotel here. So he bitches and moans. Now, the Commodore Hotel across the street. Uh, where mom says she went to a cotillion once, which was interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's been around for a while. Uh, the Commodore says, well, we'll let you stay for free over here. I mean, we'll use the good press right now, you know. Um, but that's when uh, Castro shows a move of absolute political brilliance. Castro's not a good guy, okay? Uh, not a good guy. Very sorry about that, uh, all the, uh, the Che Guevara T-shirt wearing motherfuckers out there. <laughs> but Castro's not a good guy, um, but he is extremely bright. Um, yeah, he's not uh, he's not some ignorant gun toting uh, revolutionary that's just, you know, uh, just a wild, crazy guy. He's a very intelligent guy, uh, well-educated guy. And uh, as I, as we said that, you know, initially he was celebrated as he's the guy that's going to overthrow this corrupt Batista government. But then when he starts taking away the, the American uh, business interests and sugar is huge in Cuba, um well, then uh, American business interests say, well, all right, then we're not buying your sugar. Um, so if you're, you're, if you're taking over, you just took over our company or at least our interest that we had in, in Cuba, we're not going to be buying your raw sugar to be processed here in the United States. So that's really going to throw a hit. They, they try to put economic sanctions on Castro. And it wasn't a government uh, thing. It was, uh, you know, individual U.S. businesses. So what's a fella to do? You got all this sugar and now nobody wants to buy it. At least the people that were buying it aren't buying it anymore. So that's when uh, Mr. Khrushchev. And well, the we haven't introduced him to the story yet. So right, I want right. to um, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here. But again, we are landing this plane for yeah, uh, the but, second part of this. You know, now we're, we're trying to put the hammer down on on Castro to try to get him under our thumb a little bit. And. All right. If we if you're not going to play ball with the United States, well, we got to find we got to find some new friends. And some new friends would be good. But now this is the part here too. We don't know upon his return to the United States, as we're saying, he's not come out as communist yet. There's concerns that he might be. Right? He's got a lot of commies within his <laughs> circle. But, he's he's uh, hanging with. Um, he's not a rough declaring. Crowd. He's not declaring himself yet. So, interestingly enough, uh, this is when after being uh, uh, refusing to stay at the hotel that was uh, almost extorting him uh, and then uh, saying no to the Commodore Hotel uh, because he you know, just wanted to make a, a statement here, Castro politically maneuvers a little uh, – uh, this is pretty fascinating here. He's going to check into a place known as the Hotel Teresa in Harlem where he will only give interviews to African-American newspapers – and meets with the likes of uh, Allen Ginsberg and Malcolm X. By the way, Allen Ginsberg did not know this. Uh, open member of NAMBLA. Yeah. yeah, that 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 one stopped me for a second. I was like, oh yeah, let's let's invite this guy to the party. He must be a good <laughs> yeah, time. He's a good time. Yeah, so I'll leave the kids at home. And uh, Malcolm X. Uh, <laughs> Malcolm X definitely a fiery guy. But you know what's crazy is that most people have, uh, a, a, as they should, when you you learn more about Malcolm X, you come away with like a more positive opinion about him. So uh, uh, Ginsburg's a revolutionary for the time. Malcolm X is revolutionary for the time. Uh, Castro's revolutionary for the time. But that is not the biggest guest that's going to show up at the Hotel Teresa in Harlem in Manhattan. All right. Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of the Soviet Union, the guy who looks like every early James Bond specter villain, uh, the premier of the Soviet Union shows up to spend some time with his new best friend. 
Okay. Khrushchev openly says that Castro and therefore Cuba would soon fall to communism because Castro is just a wild horse that needs to be broken and trained. Right. But he would said this in a loving way where he's like, oh, we're going to have him on our side. Don't let me show you what I can make that boy into. Right. You know what I mean? You give Come me a right. raw prospect right. and I'll, I'll turn him into a Super Bowl champion. And uh, again, it, going back to what I was saying before, if the American interests aren't going to be buying uh Cuba's sugar. Well, then the Soviets offer that. That so the Soviets now start becoming, uh, you know, the, their new best friends of, of Cuba. And you know, we've we've had a long fear of uh, of Khrushchev because he, you know, he's a wild man. Uh, there was um, some earlier speeches that he gave um, where he declared that we will bury you, telling the, the Western. Uh, the Western countries that we will bury. He looks you. like you know, Goldfinger. You know, yeah. Well, whether that was going to be a, in nuclear war, we will bury you or whatever. Again, we're in the we're deep in this uh, the Cold War. That there's a a huge fear of the of the Soviets and Khrushchev and everything else. Tell me that doesn't look like Oric Goldfinger looks exactly like Khrushchev yep. to me. Yep, absolutely. So definitely absolutely. A, a villain thing. Probably definitely something for the time too that they were uh, you know definitely playing off of your your primal fears. Absolutely. So absolutely. Because when did that come out? When did Goldfinger come out? In the 60s, right? 1964. There you go. So well, there we go. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we knew what we were up against with uh, Khrushchev. And uh, actually, this meeting uh, of Khrushchev and Castro is in 1960. And the reason why Khrushchev and Castro were both in New York City is because there was going to be a big, a big powwow, a big meeting at the at the UN in New York City. That's why they were th- that's oh, yeah. why they were flying into New York to begin with. Castro gives a, I believe, record speech of like four hours and twenty minutes or something like that. That still stands to this day, of him just bolstering and screaming and uh, decrying. Uh, he specifically mentions monarchism and imperialism, but also specifically talks about the U.S.'s um, history of aggression, which, by the way, he does have a legitimate axe Absolutely. to grind. However, I do believe, as Neil Young referred to us, we are the kinder, gentler machine gun hand. Um, so, yeah, there's and, a lot and, going on there. And, it's, so, and that was that speech, I believe, was given at the U.N. in 1960. And at the San Khrushchev is standing up and applauding Castro's speech. Oh, yeah. So uh, you know, he's he's got an audience and Khrushchev is not making he's, any any uh, hiding anything about um, the his new allegiance, if you will, with the with the Cuban folks. And then Khrushchev actually gives a, a very famous speech in that 1960 uh, U.N. meeting where he's taking his shoe off and he's banging it on the table. <laughs> the, the shoe banging speech um, that uh, somebody was um, going against uh, communist uh, uh, ideas, if you will, and he starts banging his shoe on the table and starts making all kinds of noises to kind of um, drown out whatever positive things they were saying to the uh, to the American side or to the Western side. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, we, we, you, got a, you got a wild man here with Goose Jeff and you got a wild man uh, not knowing where he's actually going to end up with uh, with Castro. Two so, wild boys on the streets a, of New York. It's some it's some scary shit here um, going on. And again, we're only 90 miles away from uh, U.S. property. So if uh, um if if the commies can get into Cuba and establish some kind of a base in Cuba, um, at that point, um, missiles could be launched. It's the legitimate worst case scenario it's the for worst American case scenario uh, national that, defense. You know, you, now you've got Washington D.C. Uh, as a, as a target, uh, an e- an easily struck target. You don't have to be flying planes. Um, overhead to drop a bomb on. You can fire a missile uh, from 90 miles away and still hit Washington, D.C., New York, Boston. Um, so you, you got some you got some pretty scary situations going on here. Well, uh, and we're going to, as we're wrapping this one up, we're going to set up some intrigue for part two here. Um, so now the two are going to make quick friends, Khrushchev and Castro backing each other up at the U.N., fiery speeches. Uh, one of the big things Castro says is that if provoked, uh, if you mess with Cuba, Cuba will respond, but it will not be alone. That's alluding to I have some friends, uh, you know, for, for my wrestling fans out there. It's, uh, you know, they're waiting. The outsiders are mentioning the third member coming down at Bash at the Beach. Could it be Hulk Hogan? But yeah. whose side is he on? <laughs> so, the final detail of his trip to New York is absolutely hilarious, but also escalates the situation further. 
uh, Castro's plane, which, by the way, is going to be taking off from Idlewild Airport. Anyone want to guess what Idlewild's called now? Yeah. <laughs> a total sc- traffic screw up? Yeah. Well, it's a giant mess. Don't get me wrong. Don't fly it. Is that what's on the sign? But we did name it after the uh, the, the eventual um, uh, American president uh, and, and the, uh, the man who's going to stand up to this Khrushchev and Castro uh, alliance here. Uh, Idlewild Airport is now known as JFK Airport. Right. So, uh, but in uh, summation here, as we're uh, wrapping it up, uh, the final detail of the trip to New York is that Castro's plane, as he and his delegation are getting ready to uh, leave after having just made this fiery UN speech and letting America know that uh, your shit stinks and we're not taking it anymore. Right. And we got friends to back us up. Oh, yeah. He, he definitely uh, uh, a lot of bluster, a lot of bravado here. Gets back uh, onto the, the tarmac here, if you will, and finds out that the planes that they arrived in had been seized by American creditors over non-payment issues. So we repoed your fucking plane, dude. <laughs> yeah, so there they are on the tarmac, and the repo man is taking exactly. your plane. So. I just picture a tow truck, and the guy's driving. He goes, Mr. Castro, this is nothing personal for me. I take no joy in it. That's just right. doing my job just here. Just doing my job. So Castro is absolutely furious and totally humiliated. But, of course, almost cartoon-like, uh, another plane pulls up alongside them on the tarmac, and uh, Khrushchev sticks his big dumb head out of the plane. He goes, comrade, you need a ride? <laughs> you come on, you get back on here. I take you back. I'm going to be stopping Cuba on my way to Russia. So that's right. Nikita Khrushchev is now going to get extra face time uh, and, and is dealing with a very angry, temperamental uh, uh, Cuban uh, uh, soon to be dictator. Uh, and now there's going to be a, a plan here in place um, that's going to have to come into play. Uh, the plan for a land invasion of Cuba was intricate and involved a very similar plan to the one they pull off in Guatemala. The plan was developed under Ike, who said out loud, he goes, I know of no other better plan to remove Castro than for this proposed land invasion. The issue is, unlike dictatorships where they get to pull off their agenda, you know what I mean? That is one optimism. Uh, dictators are typically pretty well accomplished. Uh, America has a new president on their hands, a young, charismatic war hero by the name of John F. Kennedy, who, even as a candidate, is being briefed regularly about Castro and the issues in Cuba by yeah. none other than Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles. Uh, yeah, and I think we should leave it there because at, at this point, it's 1960. Uh, Castro just flew back to Cuba <laughs> with the help of Khrushchev. And then uh, uh, we're in the middle of a presidential uh, election season where we have this young uh, John F. Kennedy uh, going against the vice president, Richard Milhouse Nixon. So those are the two candidates for the 1960 election. Had Nixon won, then this plan from Ike probably would have just been turned over to Nixon. And again, I don't want to play uh, uh, Monday morning quarterback here, but Nixon proved he was willing to get his hands significantly more dirty than JFK would prove to be. So you wonder if Bay of Pigs would have worked out under a Nixon uh, administration. So, yeah, let's, let's just close it out there that we have um, we have the Republican uh, uh, Nixon uh, candidate and the Democratic uh, presidential candidate Kennedy uh, now going into the 1960 election and uh, Castro and Khrushchev and everybody else just made their plans uh, certainly known that Castro's got a new best friend in the, in the Soviets and where are we where do we go from here and the uh, the Dulles boys are uh, well uh, I believe at this point um, the elder Dulles is dead but Alan Dulles now has the ear of uh, the man who's soon to be president here. And now we've set up all the major pieces, and we hope that you guys enjoyed learning a little bit about the Guatemalan coup, because I didn't know much about this before researching it for the show. Um, But that being said, guys, if you enjoy the show, please make sure you tune in next week for part two on this bad boy. And then also, if you can, uh, give us a little bit of support. You want to check out the Patreon? I love that. You want to leave us a written review to balance out that one guy who told us that uh, we didn't – we he had to turn it off because we weren't going to say anything insightful. Um, (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, dude. All right. The show exists as a primer so that people can get a little bit of research. This guy wants me to somehow do a, a in my <laughs> yeah. in my weekly show I do with my dad at a comic book themed studio. I'm supposed to have some sort of a deep military history where we can get to go in on a, a deep dive. And I'm sorry, TJ, we'll give you your money back. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It's a free fucking show. Um, <laughs> Try Ken Burns. See what he might do for you. <laughs> yeah, man. Go. Ken Burns will get you somewhere with his terrible Ramones haircut. But at uh, an hour uh, 12 here, I think we're going to wrap this bad boy up for right now we're going to finish up uh in the next episode that'll be specifically just on the invasion of the bay of pigs and the the failure and the fallout from that 
Uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed this primer for it to give you guys a little bit of an idea why the thing happened. So again, uh, feel free to jump over onto the Patreon. End of the month episode is going to be the War of 1812. Uh, support us over on uh, any social media that you can. I really appreciate it. And hopefully someday Stand Up will come back and I'll have some dates to plug on this one. But that being said, thank you to Mike and Ming over to Shared Universe Podcast Studio. And this was part one of the Bay of Pigs, American Loser. An American loser the day I was born. An American loser the day I was born. An American loser the day I was born.